Well, the first thing that occurred to me once I was asked to do this is why me? Because there's so many people that uh, have been closer to the Chelsea than myself, and but I was very felt privileged and. Uh, uh, so I got a copy of the book and started reading and it started immediately pulling me in, pulling me in, and I soon had this revelation that the Chelsea Hotel influenced my life considerably as uh, a young teenager, 16 year old in Phoenix, Arizona, my best friend Vince Fernier, better known as Alice Cooper. Uh, we. We bonded in art class through our love of uh, art. We loved the surrealist and the Dada artist, but we also loved the pop artist. Uh, our art teacher played Bob Dylan for us for the first time. That influenced us. And also Leonard Bernstein. We loved uh, West Side Story. So I'm, I start reading this book and I immediately realize that this stuff, as we thought, well, that's coming from New York City, but it was coming specifically from the Chelsea. And, uh, and, it, and it had a lot to do with what the Alice Cooper group did. Our approach, uh, we, we, were, we wanted to apply art to our band, and we did. And, uh, and this thing uh, affected my whole life and I didn't realize what extent it did until I started reading this book that uh, the, the initial concept of, of the Chelsea Hotel was so far reaching that it reached these two little 16 year old nerds in uh, art class in Phoenix, Arizona, the middle of the desert. And here we are, and I love the book. It really is, uh, 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 it's more than just the history of the hotel. It's the history of New York City. It's the history of art. It's uh, the history of uh, Europe. It's, uh, it's wonderful. And so let me, uh, let me toss the ball over to the person who we're here to listen to. Uh, what I would really like to start off with is if you could tell us about the birth of the Chelsea Hotel. Well, uh, can you hear me? Is this working? So the, if, you, if you look around in this room, you look at how different everyone is from everyone else. There are people with money here and people with no money here. There are older people and younger people. There are um, people of all, this is a completely diverse group. This would never have happened in the 1880s because everyone felt that they were, the only way they could define themselves was through their income and their social position because there, there wasn't any European type of social position. So all you had was money to, to segregate yourself from everybody else. So um, uh, it, was, it was a striated, uncreative time, and uh, there was no real native culture that was, that was getting any traction going. In New York City, everything was borrowed from Europe course you know everybody wanted to the wealthy people wanted to speak French and wanted to get your paintings from Europe etc cetera, etc cetera. but then there was a there was a, a crack in the social structure that happened when you know uh, boss Tweed stole 45 million dollars of the you know from uh, from the society and uh, uh, the, there was a huge recession and then all of during the recession the wealthy bought so much of the national assets and took it which you know should sound familiar to us <laughs> so it's a very similar pattern and all of and and it and, and this trauma of this situation caused people to come together in a way that they hadn't before in New York over at Cooper Union uh, they would come together in meetings and 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 start to talk among each other what rich and not so rich and women and men and so on wh about wh what happened how did we let this happen well, now we're going to be paying for this for generations in our city and uh, and b it was because we were apathetic we, we didn't want to bother with that and so on and so on so there was a crack there was an, a moment of opportunity and into this moment walked uh, a man named Philip Hubert whose descendant is sitting right here so <laughs> I think that you people who live in the Chelsea Hotel 
you have a descendant of Philip Huber here. I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm rushing, but I'm thrilled because I've I've never I've never met anyone related in person related to Philip Huber, and it's thrilling because he made such a uh, such a wonderful building. Anyway, he came from France. His father had been a, a, a rather radical utopian uh, th uh, follower of the of the of the philosopher Charles Fourier. He had been an architect, and he tried to design a community according to Charles. Charles Fourier's uh, precepts, which and, and what, what what this utopian philosopher believed was that a society could only be healthy if 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 ev members of every different personality type were represented in the society. It had to be completely diverse, and the society had to be created like a structure to contain people in a way that they were not uh, uh, warped. Their personalities were not warped by like having to work for a slave master of an employer or having to marry someone in order to survive. All of these, these ways that money uh, distorts people's lives. So it was like you had to build a society which he called a phalanx uh, that, was like a, that was like a piano holding all of the keys the piano keys and each key would be a, a note, it would be a different type of human being. So this basic structure, even though Philip Hubert wasn't as radical as his father was, he was a more practical-minded person. He was, they had, they had uh, fled New York in 18, I mean, France in 1848, the revolution, and come to New York hoping to uh, plant the seeds of, of Fourierism here in, New York, in, in America, and it didn't work out for a while, for a few decades. But then uh, Philip Hubert became an architect, and he found, he came up with this practical way to, f to force people of diverse backgrounds to communicate with each other in New York, which just wasn't happening very much before. And the way he did it, and everybody lived in their private brownstones at the time, and, and apartment buildings were rare and considered sort of exotic and a little bit scandalous. But he created these huge cooperative buildings, and he suggested that you can save money. It was getting very expensive, of course, after the recession, and you know prices were rising, and middle class was being crowded out of New York. So he said, you can, you middle class people, you can save a lot of money if you live together and share the maintenance costs of a building. So he invented, he basically introduced the cooperatives system into New York, um, which was great. And people started to find what one journalist wrote is this new sociable way of living. Like they could get to know neighbors in their building and, and they could have conversations and maybe they, you know, something creative would be born of that. But the problem is that old habits die hard and so the rich people made their own cooperative cooperative, the middle class people made their own cooperatives, and so on, and, and uh, the working class people just lived in the tenements and nobody paid any attention to them. So, um, so uh, Hubert decided to make a new kind of cooperative in th what was then the theater district on 23rd Street, and this time he was going to make people of different backgrounds live together. And the way he did that was through the structure of the building. On each floor, you would have uh, 12 room apartments or eight room apartments wrapping around either each end of the floor, but then closer to the central stairwell in the elevator, he would put smaller and smaller apartments so that you had a, an economic range. And also, uh, there would be apartments that were owned and apartments that were rented out also on each floor. And the top floor, he put a row of artist studios. And then, to make sure that people actually mixed and didn't just go into their private apartments, which were very private because the walls were three feet thick and they were soundproofed. But um, uh, this is a very long answer to your question. <laughs> uh, <laughs> sorry about no, that. But it's uh, such an important part of the story. <laughs> So, um, I'll go on then. So, uh, so, uh, <laughs> so, um, uh, so you, you were very private. He, he wrote about this. He said, it, you know, he, it was very important that you feel like you were in a private home when you were inside your apartment. When you go outside, he wanted there to be a lot of interaction. So he put very rudimentary kitchens or no kitchens in the apartments, and he put a big communal kitchen downstairs and, and linked dining rooms where the, the usually the, the residents would eat together. They would dine together, so like a resort hotel. That was the, the structure of it was like a hotel. And that was also roughly the structure of the Fourier's utopian communities, because life was supposed to be fun. 
And what's more fun than living in a hotel? So the, even though it wasn't actually literally a hotel at the time, it was a cooperative, that was the structure. So there were lots of, lots of places to interact, not just the dining rooms and not just the lobby, which he made sort of cozy like a lodge. He had wanted to put wooden beams on the ceiling um, like a lodge, but the, the, his partners wouldn't let him because it, it uh, made it more liable to catch fire. And, um, but he made the, deliberately made the hall always eight feet wide, so they would be like village streets. So when you came out, you would tend to hang out there and maybe put a couch there and sit down and, and talk with your neighbors. And the, his crowning glory of the building was the roof, where he built a pyramid a uh, penthouse on the roof that was a clinic. He intended as a clinic, and you would, so you didn't have to leave the building. If you got sick, you could just go up there, and your neighbors could visit you, and uh, you know you could be cared for there. The streets were really dirty. You didn't have to go out there. And there was a, a, pr a brick, pr it was all paved with brick. This was uh, like a, a patented, new patented thing. It was really, they were very excited about this. Uh, it was completely fireproof. And there was a big promenade along the back that was the width of the building so that you didn't have to go down the street. You could take the children up to the top of the building and you could go for walks up there. And he wanted to put awnings up there. And then in the middle, there, there were uh, uh, the tops of uh, artist studios. And there were duplex studios there and uh, they had private little private gardens and there was a, a garden behind the pyramid so this was this was really the most enjoyable place for the residents to mix from the beginning and uh, it's on until almost the present <laughs> uh, uh, the, until the last few years I guess that's where all the parties took place up yes there, right? uh, yes <laughs> a lot of party well yeah a lot of parties took place there in a lot of I art experimentation a lot of creative work a lot of um, uh, of meetings and probably love affairs started there and so on it had a spectacular view and at the time um, it was built there were very few electric lights so you could see all the stars above you there were not all of the big buildings so you could see all the way to Brooklyn you could see all the water around the island it was just an amazing building just had one low church on each side at the time no you know and it was just this gargantuan thing just sticking up there and that was what made me want to write the book because I didn't want to write I was writing another book and I, you know I kept finding just stumbling across these great Chelsea Hotel stories and resisting them you know oh my god what this happened there but I'm not gonna write it. I'm not gonna write about it and then one day it was it was rain pouring rain and I was crossing 23rd Street at 7th Avenue and I remembered the Chelsea was over there so I looked over and there were these roiling clouds and this pouring rain and all of a sudden this flash of lightning just forked over the Chelsea and it, I just saw it for the first time and I thought you know what was this like 120 years ago? What is this building doing there? And, and at a time when, when nobody cared at all about American art, you, you know, what, what was this big palace doing there with a bunch of artists living in it? And I got hooked, and that was seven years ago. <laughs> so without that weather event, you may not have resisted. done this wonderful <laughs> book. Yes. But you know, the Chelsea gets what the Chelsea wants. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was demanding that you <laughs> write the book. <laughs> well, in my imagination, anyway, it's what motivated me to myself. So, well, that's that's amazing. I I can't imagine anybody crossing the street and seeing that and not thinking that that's an omen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's yeah. So and then when I w first walked in, uh, I would talk to Stanley Bard, who was the owner and. Uh, co-owner and manager at the time. I walk, he, he was temporarily in the back room, which was originally one of the dining rooms. And uh, uh, he was, uh, because the usual office was being renovated. So I went back there and there were a bunch of people, it was just a bunch of desks in this space. And he was, it, and he started to talk to me. I was just in another person and they come in every day to interview him. And all, and, but in the course of telling me about the hotel, he suddenly got really upset and started talking about how 
how he'd been kicked off the board of directors and he wasn't going to stand for this and they were going to try to get rid of him and they, they didn't like the way he was running the hotel and he just completely lost it. And this other younger man came up and started saying, shh, shh, this is a reporter, shut up, you don't want to tell her all this stuff. And that was David Bard, his son, I found out later. But, but he didn't stop and he took me on a tour of the building in typical Stanley fashion. And so m my arrival at the Chelsea was pretty much at the beginning of his departure. So all of these years, while this tragedy has been happening to the Chelsea, you know, I've been outside it, but watching this, th the, these horrors, you know, one after another taking place, you know, with, with Stanley's departure. And most of the time I've been writing the book, he hasn't even been there. And it's just been an emotional uh, experience that I hadn't at all expected when I started. I thought it would just be a quick, quick story, you know, <laughs> and I would tell it and move on, but it didn't turn out that way. Uh, your writing <laughs> style is so researched and so amazing to me that it's hard to imagine you writing a book fast. <laughs> Well, it, it, what I, I like to do uh, best, it, it, with this book and with the last book at least, I don't know if I'll keep doing this, is it fascinates me to see, uh, you know, you read a biography of Arthur Miller, but you don't really have an idea of the context in which he was, he was creating what he was creating, unless you know who he was living with, you know, who he was talking to every day, what experiences he was he was having and it becomes so multidimensional if you if you look at the way it actually was with all of us, you know with someone uh, someone else with with you know he, Dylan Thomas or with Brendan Bean up, upstairs you know these were the this was the atmosphere in which these people lived and worked and people don't understand that when they see the play they don't understand where th all of this comes from where the art you know, it's just absolutely fascinating to me, and I can't, I couldn't stop once I started. You know, I would just do, I would, I would make, you know, timelines of each person's life, and then I would see where it intersected with others, and there would be these little hot spots of several lines intersecting, and that would be what I would focus on, and that was how I structured the book, just moving from one big knot to, an, to the next, so and it people was that addictive. People found out that I've been involved in this, uh, a couple of people have said the same thing, a fly on the wall. Well, you, uh, this book is like a fly on the wall, and it's because of that research that you take all of those things, and almost every paragraph is like you solving this Rubik's Cube of how all of these things fit together. Well, at least it's how I am imagining it, you know. It's I'm sure there are, you know, there are there are a lot of times when I'm imagining it incorrectly, but I'm doing my best to to imagine how it was, you know, through the through the documentation. And there are other ways. Th the wonderful thing about the Chelsea is that there's every person who tells the story about the Chelsea will tell it differently. And there are a lot of other books about the Chelsea that also, I mean, it's so multidimensional that you can't have enough. There's a, a book that came out recently, I think James Luff is, is the author, that's an oral history of the, it's, it's, uh, focusing especially on the 80s and the 90s. But this is also important. You know, this is, uh, you know, all of these, there's just too much in this place. It, I mean, each of my chapters was between 407, my, my husband's rolling his eyes, <laughs> so between 400 and 700 pages. And I had to just, uh, each chapter, you know, and I had to just cut, 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 cut. It was just, that was, you know, I wrote, I mean, I put the book, those chapters together in, in about a year, but it took the rest of the time to cut it down. And so all of that stuff is on the cutting room floor. And all of that work has been done in that place. It's, it's a, you know, this place is a landmark culturally and, and architecturally, but it, only the exterior is legally landmarked. It's unbelievable to me that the that the function of the hotel is not landmarked. And I, I really believe it should be, if there's any legal way to do it, that it really should be preserved, you know, legally preserved. You know, <laughs> I think I'm going to get some agreement here, but, <laughs> but uh, you know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's amazing how uh, the ups and downs uh, uh, economically and politically and everything have affected the Chelsea over the years, but still somehow it's still managed to serve the same purpose of supporting artists. 
Yeah, it's a, 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 a big belief of, of Philip Hubert was um, that if you change the, the physical uh, environment, then that will change people's lives. And, uh, he, and this, was, this building was, was deliberately designed to do what it has done. And it went, it, the cooperative, there were cooperative members, original members still living in the building up until the 1930s. So they still had their little yellowed leases, you know, they got to pay a hundred dollars a month, you know, up through the 1930s for eight-room apartments, some of them, you know. Uh, and so, of course, the place went bankrupt <laughs> as, a, as a result. But, but you know, there, there has been a bit of a continuity. And, you know, it's, it's been hard to know how much of the lore of the Chelsea got passed on from the older residents to the newer ones. You know, I didn't find a lot of written record of that. But you have to imagine, you look at Edgar Lee Masters, who was there in the 30s, and he writes uh, so in, in his poem about the Chelsea Hotel, you know, he writes about Mark Twain being there, and that's really, you know, the only, I didn't, fi I went through Mark Twain's notebooks, and I didn't see a reference to his being there. But you know that Masters was there at the same time as the original residence. So you, and, and he was writing a biography of, of, uh, of Mark Twain while he was living at the hotel. So you know that he knew, you know, and, and I was able to place Mark Twain in the city at the time when his best friend, William Dean Howells, was living at the hotel. So, you know, I was able to deduce that that no doubt happened. He did come to the dinners. He probably did give talks there. Uh, but, but from that, you can see that, that the, some of the stories were passed on. But essentially, it seems, I mean, it's, I don't, didn't find any evidence that anyone remembered who Philip Huber was after the 1920s. You know, although Edgar Lee Masters' son in 1935, his son Hilary Masters, who's now a writer, he was about eight uh, at that time. And he said um, that he would go up to the top of the winding stairs every morning, and there was a woman who lived in uh, what became Virgil Thompson's apartment. And uh, she had it to herself, little old lady, and every morning her constitutional was to run down the stairs and go out to breakfast, and then run back up the stairs. And then she would do the same for dinner. And he would wait for her, and he would race her down the stairs, and she would always try to beat him, <laughs> this little old lady. And he told me that it was rumored that she was Philip Hubert's wife, the architect's wife, that he didn't know, hadn't heard the name, you know. So, so there are these hints. Yeah, your mother. I mean, I mean, Cornelia didn't didn't think that this was true. But the second wife, she was alive at the time, that year, and she came to New York that year or the next year. So I don't know. You know, I didn't say that it was her, but it could have been. You know, she was much she was much younger. She was his daughter's age. You know, but but the point of this is that. You don't know how much it overlaps. You don't know how much one generation is is getting from another, but uh, so I don't know how much that affected the fact that the building continued with its same purpose, its same function from generation to generation. To me, it seems like it was the structure of the building more than anything else, because the bards came in and they weren't particularly, you know, looking for an artist's hotel. David Bard, who bought it in the 40s after the last cooperative member died, um, he, he thought it was just a good buy. It was the Depression. It was cheap. And, and he quit, actually. He, he, he gave away his shares and left. And the partners made him come back because they couldn't get along without him there as an arbitrator. So he came back, and only gradually, through his talks with Edgar Lee Masters and Virgil Thompson and Arthur, you know, later Arthur Miller, well, before... Arthur Miller, but, you know, with these artists, they sort of trained him. And he fell in love with the idea of having this artist hotel. And he w had this traditional um, hotel owner's desire to please, you know, which was very charming. And, uh, and, and so he wanted to please the artists. And, and, and Stanley just went a few steps further, you know, but, but he had to be educated. You know, by the by, the residents who live there. So it wasn't that he walked in and bought an artist hotel. I I thought that was very interesting, and it continued to work. And it, and it you know be, uh, partly because of the overlapping generations, and partly because, but largely because of the structure. I think. Well, that's amazing that the it was initially conceived for that, and that it and it served the function. 
And the question is, will it continue to serve the function? It's interesting. I've been taking people, uh, because of this book, on tours of the building with the owner, Ed Sheets, the new owner, and he, it, he, he really seems genuinely fascinated by the history of the hotel. And he first, he said, told me years ago when they first bought the building, that he fell in love with the idea of the Chelsea when he read Patti Smith's Just Kids. And he says, he, you know, to me, when, when we take people on tours, that he is trying to structure the hotel the way it originally was, according to its original philosophy. So he has shown me a room that he says he'll rent for $1,000 a night that is larger and that he's it's a little tacky looking now, but he says he's going to redecorate it. And uh, next to it is a smaller room, about the size of the usual small rooms, but with a great state-of-the-art bathroom in it, by the way, <laughs> and uh, looking out on an air shaft. And he says that that's going to cost $200 a night. So he is going to, yes, that's what I thought. <laughs> Uh, well, okay. <laughs> I still can't afford to stay there, but maybe somebody can. And uh, uh, but he says, you know, he he is structuring it that way, and he says he's going to put like refreshments out in the hall, so people will be encouraged to mingle. So it's interesting to me if this is true, and we don't know, you know, how it will end up. But it's interesting that if he does do that, whatever his motive is, and what uh, whatever he intends to do with the hotel. If he does it, it will still be structured the way it was intended to be structured. And who knows what's going to happen in the future, you know? I mean, hotels go bankrupt all the time. Ownership changes all the time. But if the structure isn't, isn't organically violated, it seems to me that the Chelsea still has a chance. I mean, you know, it's like a tree. It has a long lifespan. So, you know, w we're going into about a decade of really bad times, <laughs> you know, but to the Chelsea, maybe that's not so long. Maybe, you know, I don't know. I, I refuse to be completely pessimistic. It seems like one of the other factors is that there have always been people in charge who were willing to waive somebody not being able to make their rent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, I would think that that might be necessary for a future for it to continue to be able to have artists thrive there. Yeah, and that was that was that was apparently the case from the beginning too because the there's a lot of documentation of the first artists at the Chelsea whose rent was one was $47 a month, one studio was 64 and they were nobody wanted their paintings. They were American toneless landscapes and so they would give away three to get groceries for the month or you know uh, one, one guy gave away three um, I think it was Charles Melville Dewey gave away three paintings uh, for a piano for his wife one winter. But they didn't, th lots of times they didn't have the rent and they, they would just talk, in their letters it says, you know, well, we're going to pay them back. You know, but they were allowed to, to go for months without paying, even from the beginning. And yeah, I mean, Ed Sheets again has sort of mumbled something about, and maybe if they can't pay the rent, maybe, <laughs> maybe I'll let them slide. <laughs> but, uh, you know, but you know, that's, I, it's, uh, I, we do want to open up the floor for discussion since I don't live with Chelsea and I'm, you know, I don't know if anyone wants to discuss the situation now or what they think might, uh, and there's always a risk <gasps> to that. But, uh, yes. I want to okay. Mm -hmm. What you said, my name is Joy Pappas and I represent the Tenants Association. Uh, part of the people who understood that to maintain uh, the Chelsea Hotel the way you are describing so wonderfully, people have to be united. Divas, personality, screaming, uh, not uh, getting together doesn't work. So they were wonderful. They were a bunch of uh, 40 apartments with 40 people or a little bit more than 40 in it who decided to start the fight. Uh, the reason for which I'm saying that not only that we did the fight, but we succeeded because when two main owners decide that they have to sell to eight sheets because they cannot pass us. Uh, using the legality. So everybody who is here, if I may say, and you are in a situation in which you are in rent-stabilized apartments, also landmark apartments, you should consider uh, if you want to, to, to uh, contact us because we can give you a lot of information and a lot of help. Ed Sheets, when he bought it, 
uh, versus what a lot of people, including the Chelsea, thought that he bought it and it's just an arrangement. It is not. He really believed exactly as you said. I met him more than the other people in the association and everybody whom he brought in, he brought in to um, recap what has uh, badly beaten. It wasn't destroyed because with people, you are right, the building is beautiful, it has some extraordinary features like the stair, like the bal balcony and so on and we admire it because uh, funnily enough after so many years finally my husband is an architect so now an architect <laughs> is living in the building, you know, it's just uh, uh, continuing a tradition. So he decided because I asked him what are you going to do, are you going to continue what the other did? or you really feel for this building and he said I do and I have my children and I want to to recreate and not to recreate to continue the the, the legacy and there are a lot of people here who are uh, a very talented photographer and artist or uh, wives of the uh, late artists and he knows that because he wanted to know who lives in the hotel and uh, my opinion is, in fact I can tell everybody that it's wonderful, uh, a room which was next to hotel, next to El Quixote, which it was a horrible, uh, basically, storage with full of probably dancing uh, mice or uh, so on. <laughs> he cleaned it perfectly. And what he's going to do, he's going to offer the artist in the Chelsea, or people, uh, we have a very talented photographer who is going to leave the Chelsea by her choice, but she's going to remain a friend of the Chelsea, and she's going to have an exhibition with her art, with photography. And uh, so, so uh, he, and he, he told uh, me today, in fact, uh, that uh, not Ed, uh, uh, someone else might talk to, that they are going to try to organize, especially until the hotel is going to be finalized, events in such a way that the culture is, uh, is uh, uh, it, it, not that the culture has disappeared, but people have to be shown and uh, the awareness has to be kept alive. And this is a very important issue for all of us. Uh, there are beautiful buildings, wonderful, but people have to be aware of them and have to bother to bring that little contribution which creates a big contribution. So I think that we are in very, very, very good hands. Also, it's a complete, uh, it, it, it's another approach, and I'm very happy to, to talk about it. And thank you. Another another interesting aspect of what you're saying is the way that Chelsea has always has always reflected in microcosm what's going on in the larger society. It's amazing the parallels. So here we have somebody, we have a wealthy person who's bought the hotel and 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 says that he wants to do right by the hotel. Right? That's very common now out in the bigger world. And you know. Jeff Bezos, was it, who bought the Washington Post, right? He's a yeah. Bezos. Yeah, you know, th things like that. You know, so so it, this is another situation like that, which is, it's it's interesting to see. Or, or, or is that what, is that what the city wants to happen to its treasure, which is Chelsea? Or do they, do, should it be run by the city? You know, it, I mean, not that there's a huge choice of what happens to it. It's, it's owned by an, an, by a group. But, um, uh, you know, it's, but, but but it, it is, to a degree, it does belong to the city, at least uh, in, in an emotional sense or in, in a, in a, as a legacy. So it's, I'm glad that, that this history has, is finished now and it can go out at this time when the Chelsea is being reinvented because it's time for not just people who live inside the Chelsea and not just the owner, but for the whole city to think about and, you know, in, in the larger artistic community in the country to think about this treasure that we have here. It, and, and what are we going to do with it? What's going to happen to it? And, you know, I have to say, the people who have lived there have been through hell for the past years with these, the asbestos dust in the building and, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the destruction of the gardens on the roof and, and, and where artists' ashes were buried, by the way. You know, there's no regard for the people, you know, for the use of, the, of, of these spaces. And it's been years and years that they've had to put up with this. And why have they put up with this? Because they love the building. I mean, it's their life, and 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 
it, it means something to them. And these people who live in the building hold the story of the Chelsea in their hearts, just the way we people who live in New York City hold its, its story in our hearts. And it's hard to feel that you're being pushed out. And, you know, I just would applaud all of you who live there and hope that, like we in the larger city, can hold on. You know, hold on, because the, the plutocrats come and go. You know, there's boom and there's bust, but there's always us. You know, if we can just hang on. So, hooray for you guys. <laughs> I hope there's a golden age, a new golden age for the Chelsea to come, but I was wondering whether what you would call the golden age of the Chelsea and whether that was your favorite period or are those two different times? A lot of people like the 60s the best because it was at, it, it, there was sort of a critical mass of, of activity happening and, and uh, just, it, it, it took I think three or four chapters to cover, for me to cover that decade, um, uh, whereas I could cover 30 years and, you know, uh, at another time in one chapter. But I like the, the Depression era the best because um, I, I loved uh, uh, the feeling among Edgar Lee Masters and John Sloan, the painter, and, and uh, um, others of, of their generation who who for the first, really for the first time were trying to lay a groundwork f to teach others, to teach the generation to come uh, of American artists how to live as an artist. And John Sloan, was, he just broke my heart, you know, his, his writing, you know, just saying, you know, live on as little money as you can and be free. You're so lucky to be artists. You're the only free people in America. Don't give it up. And all of these lessons that they had, that had been so hard for them to learn. And, you know, the, the, the apex of their careers as artists were over, but their, their, their lives as teachers were so valuable too. And they just lay down this sort of loam at the Chelsea that, it, that the seeds were planted in so other generations could come up. And so I have just a special fondness for that time and those, those people. We're running a little short on time, but I think we have time for a couple more questions. In the back. Thank you. I, I just did want to move forward a little bit and maybe ask Dennis to give him to, to give us one or two impressions of the Chelsea in your time. Well, um, like I say, I, it influenced me early on and I didn't even know it. I was just influenced by everything that came out of the Chelsea thinking, well, it's just coming from back east or New York. I was in Phoenix, Arizona and young and loved art, pop artists and everything. But uh, when the Alice Cooper group uh, came through in our early days uh, where we were sort of like every, for every person that said we had made it, there, were, there was a longer line of people that didn't like us, so uh, we came through, we stayed at the Chelsea Hotel. I think we could barely afford to, uh, to stay there at the time, uh, but uh, our guitar player who had a great sense of humor said, hey, Dan, I want to come to my room. You know, I want to show you my beautiful view of New York City. So we go walk into his room, he leaves the door open and takes me into the bathroom and he opens the window and one inch beyond the window is a brick wall. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, okay, that's a nice view. He's like, pretty nice, huh? So uh, anyway, we, uh, the, the, we walked back into his bedroom and a girl had walked into the room with le leopard skin pants. Jeez, uh, I don't even know if I can tell this story. <laughs> Uh, let's put it this way. Uh, as the evening wore on, uh, the creatures of the night uh, came out of the woodwork and it got mighty strange. Uh, I ended up at one point, uh, somebody took me way up to the uh, uh, residence on the top floor and uh, ha really gave me the feeling of Rosemary's baby. I don't know, people that have lived there are here that can relate to that? Yes. You can? Okay, well, I'm not imagining it then. then it was a, and then I saw uh, there was an, a door that somebody was drawing tiny, tiny circles on. They, they had drawn them. The person wasn't there. And uh, I'm asking, what, 
well, it looks like somebody's keeping track of something here. And they said, well, that's an artist who is a speed freak who knows every time he does speed that it kills a certain amount of brain cells. And he's, each one of those represents a, a dead brain cell. I'm like, OK, well, this place is different. And, and I do remember, and you mentioned this in the book more than once, and I can really relate to it, because when I think of the Chelsea beyond those stories and the, and the decadent evening that happened, uh, I remember the dusty curtains, heavy, heavy curtains in the room, and, those, and they were very dusty. Uh, so, uh, you know, we were just coming through one of um, a bazillion stories that happened there, I'm sure. I mean, it's, uh, it's so, there were so many different kinds of people uh, that I had never seen before. You know, it was beyond my imagination. And, and uh, the pop art, you know, I remember walking into the lobby for the very first time, and up on the wall was a big a collage, I guess you would call it. But it was a, a glass display case, and it was full of uh, forks and knives and spoons, and it was called arterial sclerosis. <laughs> that was in the lobby. <laughs> and I remember Alice and I thinking we were pretty hip on pop art from our younger years in high school, you know, think, yeah, yeah, I get it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's pretty much the extent of my story without uh, trying to tell other stories in mixed company. <laughs> <laughs> all right well that's about all that we have time for tonight but thank you so much for dennis and cheryl coming out and thanks to all of you